The Big Story. It was Sunday morning along U.S. Highway 66, heading west from Tulsa toward Clinton, Oklahoma. Mrs. Rose Penn and her son were driving to church. Jim. Jim, stop the car. What's the matter, Ma? I told you, stop the car. Don't you see it over there? On the side of the road, a cot. There's a man sleeping on that cot. Well, that's no business of ours, is it, Ma? The fellow's got a right to sleep. You get on out of this car and find out why he's sleeping there on the cot beside the road. Weather like this. Now, go on. Well? Well, what are you standing there for? Is he all right? Is he sleeping? He's sleeping, Ma. He's sleeping, but he ain't never going to wake up. Tulsa, Oklahoma. The story of a reporter who found three golden coins that spelled death. Tulsa, Oklahoma. The story as it actually happened. Reporter Nolan Bullock's story as he lived it. You, Nolan Bullock of the Tulsa Tribune, are a reporter with a flattened nose. And you got it by sticking it consistently into other people's business. Like now. You sit in the fashionable Will Rogers Hotel in Claremore near Tulsa and take part in a business conference. The business being, since Oklahoma is a dry state, bootlegging. And your job, that of undercover agent for the State Crime Bureau. Your name for today, Nolan Bullock, is Mr. Norton. Mighty good meal they serve here, Mr. Norton. Mighty good. Cigar, Mr. Ritchie. Uh Okay, perfect. Thank you kindly. I have been sitting quiet all through the meal, Mr. Ritchie. Do we talk business now? Uh, yes, sure thing, Mr. Norton, but to tell you the truth, I-, I don't think we can make a deal. You've had a week to check my credit? No, 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 it, it's not the credit. Well, what is it then? I've been without merchandise three and a half weeks uh, now. Now, look, I-, I explained to you last time, a change in a corporation as big as mine, that takes time, Mr. Norton. When Mr. Veazey was alive, the man in charge before Mr. Breeden, I told him, you've got to prepare for eventualities like this, but he didn't listen to me. Nobody listens to an accountant. Look, all I know is that I've got to have 21 cases of stock delivered. so loud, please, Mr. Norton. And I need two dozen barrels weekly, regularly. Now, when am I going to get a definite answer? You know, there are other firms to deal with. Oh, now, you wouldn't want to do that, Mr. Norton. When Mr. Breeden comes in and takes over, that's the man you'll want to deal with, and the only one in this state. I worked for Mr. Breeden years ago, and I tell you frankly, I'm looking forward to his return. Things never were the same in all the years he was away. He's a fine man, Mr. Breeden. Strictly business, but the best terms you could get. Believe me. Look, I know about Mr. Breeden. All I am asking you now is when does he get here? When can we make our final arrangements? uh, To tell you the truth, Mr. Norton, he ought to have been here yesterday. He left California, oh, must have been three days ago. I believe I'll wire him and find out if there was any change in his plans. I've got 121 establishments waiting on Mr. Breeden. Those customers want beer. They want wine. They want whiskey. And they want it now. They are not interested in any of my business difficulties. And so you, Nolan Bullock, undercover agent and reporter, watch the pleasant accountant leave. And you make your call. Capital 2000. State Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Let me have Mr. Oliver, please. Yes? This is Nolan Bullock. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't talk to you now. Well, I have just left Richie. He expects Breeden in a few days. For Pete's sake, I can't talk to you. I've got to run. Where have you got to run? Well, if you must know, dead man reported out on Route 66. Now, look, I'm supposed to be out there. I can't sit here talking to you. Murder? Yeah, it looks like it. Well, you don't have to talk to me on the phone. I'll meet you there. Where is it? Oh, no. I'm not ready to give anything out on this. Now, look, Nick, if you don't tell me where to meet you on that killing, I'll get off this breeding case fast. <laughs> That's blackmail. You call it what you like. Where is it? About two miles outside of Clinton on Route 66. Big gas station left side of the road. You can't miss it. I won't. And so you, Nolan Bullock, 
drop the story about the bootleg syndicate, and hop on the biggest story, the story of murder. And now you stand with Special Investigator Nick Oliver, both of you shaking your head at the dead man lying on the cot, just off Route 66, near Clinton. No possible way of identification, Nick? Uh, nothing. I'll get Haynes of the Fingerprint Bureau in, see if his prints tell us anything. I don't think even a mother would recognize his face. Hey, where are you going? Just looking around. I wish that ambulance would get here. I... What are you looking for? Just something in the grass, Nick. Hey, what do you know? It's a coin. And here's another one. Let me see. Those are Mexican coins, right? That's what they are. Well, what are they doing here? How do I know? Well, we've got something, anyhow. It's not much more than nothing, but it's something. Huh, finally, the ambulance. Yes, Lydia. Okay, send him in. Somebody thinks he's got something on the murder, Nolan. <laughs> and somebody's got something more than we have, Nick. Reverend Burns? Not Reverend, sir, Mr. Burns. You see, Lieutenant, I'm not an ordained minister, merely an evangelical preacher who tries to bring a little understanding. Now, Lieutenant... It's not Lieutenant, just Mr. I beg your pardon, sir? Like you said, not Lieutenant, just Mr. Quite right, sir. Now, last Saturday, sir, I was holding my regular campfire meeting. We hold campfire meetings every Saturday evening, all the way up and down Highway 66. That night, sir, I was preaching on the subject I of the I thought return. you said you knew something about the murder. I was coming to that directly, sir. It was toward the end of my sermon. The disturbance came from a campfire not too far distant. But you see, sir, the men were shouting and the wind you see was blowing. Please, Mr. Burns, And so I... you see, their voices were, were wafted in my direction. There were three men, sir, and they were having, I must say, a most profane fight. You can imagine the language. And? Well, that's all, sir. I knew something dreadful was going to happen, and I thought for a moment I would intervene. But then I thought better of it, and I didn't, and that's all that happened. Did you see any of them, their faces? It was rather a dark night. If it's of any value, though I don't see how it possibly can be, they had a station wagon parked next to the fire. And I think one of the men amidst the profanity called the other Ace. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. Not at all, sir. I shall be holding a meeting on Saturday as usual, just two miles out of Tulsa on Route 66. If you should want me... Thank you. Uh, mind closing the door? <laughs> well, that's a great help. Somebody name of Ace. And there was a station wagon. Maybe. Don't forget it was a dark night. <laughs> but the wind was blowing. <laughs> a week goes by. A week of feverish activity by Nick Oliver on the murder story. And by you, Nolan Bullock, on the murder case and on the bootleg syndicate. And when you add it all up, it's less than the faint sound of the name Ace on the night air. You keep spending time at headquarters. Waiting, hoping, and mostly dozing. And then... A routine message comes through on the police teletype. Request owner, Oklahoma license, 71391. Truck stranded here. Answer soonest. Police chief, Indio, California. And Nick Oliver puts through the routine request in the routine way. <laughs> License 71391. Name. Hey, Nolan, wake up. Huh? What? What's the matter? Wake up. What did you say? Guess whose truck is stranded out in California. What are you talking about? That request we got from Indio. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. What about it? The owner of that car in California was named Thomas Breeden. Breeden? Well, that's my man. Get California on the phone. Eddie, you put me through to the police chief in Indio. Who'd you think I was calling, Nolan? My bootlegger? Yes, that's right, Chief. Fellow's name was Thomas Breeden. And we're interested in him, too. Uh, tell me everything you've got. Oh, you jailed him. Mm -hmm. That's why he didn't meet me. In the coop in California. Uh-huh. El Paso, huh? What do you know? What about El Paso? Hey, Nick, what about El Paso? You check with the FBI, huh? Yeah, fine, fine. What is this FBI, El Paso? Nick! Chief, you've been very helpful. <laughs> is there any time you're in Tulsa? Yes, yeah, Chief, I'll do that. 
<laughs> say, how's the weather out there? Nick. 92 degrees, huh? Well, you don't say. We got blizzard weather here. Hey, so long, Chief. Well, do you want me to strangle you? It uh, seems your friend Tom Breeden was picked up about a week ago by the police chief in Indio. Uh, he was driving a truck, went through a red light and hit somebody. <laughs> Wasn't serious. They put him in the coop for five days, took his prints and all that. Chief said he acted like a man going to be sentenced to the chair. Nervous. Yeah, so he checked on him in Washington. Oh, I don't know. There was some delay, I guess, on the chief's end in checking the prints with Washington. And he didn't get the answer on Breeden until after he was let out. Look, Nick, get to the point. Okay. When the report came through, it seems Breeden is wanted by the federal authorities at El Paso for entering the country illegally with close to $17,000 in Mexican coins. Mexican coins? That's what the man said. When he last left California, he was seen driving in a station wagon with two men. One named Bronson, one named Stiles. The first name of the fellow called Stiles was Ace. What about Breeden? Well, you see, Nolan, the reason you never met Breeden is because his prints are the same as those of the man we saw on the cut off U.S. 66, Awful Dead. <laughs> What started out for you, Nolan Bullock, reporter for the Tulsa Tribune, as an undercover job as a bootlegger, is now a murder story involving the FBI, two indistinct figures named Ace Stiles and somebody Bronson, and $17,000 in Mexican coins. You and Nick Oliver know you aren't much nearer a solution than you were the time you stood and looked at the battered head of Thomas Breeden. And so... You decide to go back to the Will Rogers Hotel in Claremore. Maybe the contact man of the syndicate, the accountant, knows something. Look, Mr. Ritchie, you said in a few days I'd get an answer. Yes, I know, I know, but something has happened to Mr. Breeden. Uh, could you use a good man in your organization? I'm a fine accountant. I'm uh, honest. And I, I am accurate. Uh, I was with Mr. Breeden for 13 years. I, I tell you, I know the bootleg business. Well, I'd like to help you, Mr. Ritchie. And maybe I can. If you put me in touch with whoever is taking over now that Mr. Breeden is... I'll be glad to as soon as I know anything. And you can use a good man in your organization? Well, we'll see. Now, right now, I'd better pay the check and get going. <laughs> yes. Well, I I'll run on ahead and see what I can find out for you. You've no idea how upset I am. Is this where I pay the check? That's right. Oh, just a moment. I I'm sorry. I nearly gave you that phony coin. I didn't mean to put the side. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me see that. Lady, that's a Mexican coin. Where did you get it? Someone's been passing them. The girl at the cigar counter got one, and I got this. When was this? This morning sometime. Who gave it to you? I didn't really notice. Some man, by the time I saw it wasn't a real coin, had already gone out. Ran out to the front steps, and I saw him drive off. He and another man was with him. Did you happen to know what they drove off in? No, just a car. Was it a station wagon? You mean one of those... Say, now that you mention it, that's just what it was. You know, I have to make that up out of my own pocket. No, you don't, sister. Here's a dollar to take its place. Let me have that little Mexican phony. Nick? Guess what happened? Come on, if you've got something, give. Remember that Mexican who showed up? Those three Mexicans? The blondes? Mm-hmm. The golden blondes. Well, I found a friend of theirs at the cashiers in the restaurant in the Will Rogers Hotel. Meet you there in an hour. Make it half an hour. 907 is my room, Nick. Room 907, hello. Uh, Mr. Norton, this is Mr. Ritchie. I've got something you'll find very exciting. You can meet the new boss. How? You know the road off US 66? Yes. Well, go past the gas station at Ember Street. It's a little dirt road, a little left off 66, a left turn. You, you can't miss it. It runs down th through the Verdigree Valley. There's a big white house, uh, green shutters. That's two and a half miles down the road. All right, thanks, Richie. Now, please don't say I told you to go there, Mr. Norton. Uh, the boss might not like it. His name is Bronson. Okay, Rich. And I won't forget. When I get a setup, I'll find a place in it for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Norton. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now what to do? Nick Oliver is on his way. Can't be reached. And you know how to find the new boss. It takes only a moment to make up your mind. You turn left at the gas station off 66. 
take the road toward Verdigree Valley. You keep her in second as you go down the incline. And the road is wide enough now for just one car. And now, coming at you is another dusty car. And there isn't room for both of you to pass. You stop. And then you see a station wagon. Not much room, huh? That's right, bud. Looks like one of us is going to have to back up. Say, is your name Ace? Which is it going to be, Mac? You or us? Who backs up? Well, I was supposed to meet a fella. I think it better be you, bud. And we're in a hurry. So you back her up, trying to get a look at the license plates, at the man in the car. There's too much dust on the road. And then finally, when you reach a point where you can back up off the road and let them pass, something inside tells you... Good luck, old fellow. You'd better keep your head down as they go by. You duck and wait for it. But it doesn't come. There's no shot. And then you see them hitting 40, 50, pulling away from you before you can swing your car back on the road and follow them. And it takes you an hour and a half, it seems, to reach the next gas station just a quarter of a mile away before you can call Nick Oliver. Nick? Well, I saw them. At least I think I saw them. I mean, Stiles and Bronson in the station wagon out on a dirt road off 66. No, 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 I checked that. There's a little gas station. That's where I'm calling from. No station wagon came out from the canyon. They must have turned off one of the side roads. There aren't many of them, I'm sure. Yes, four or five men can do the job. All right, I'll wait here. Shut it off, Nick. Over there. You see it? That's the wagon. Very convenient. Nice place for a headquarters. A house in the valley and a car. Only let's go slow. You sure this is the wagon? Sure, I'm sure. Well, let's see what's in it. Okay, huh? put your light over here. What have you got? There's a gash in the back seat. It's a big bow, you see it? Yes, I see it. Mexican blondes. Quite a bunch of them. Very nice. Look at this. What do you think this is? Here? Right here. Is it rust? My guess is blood. And this is a wrench. Might be what they did it with. Yeah, it's heavy enough, and it's got the same kind of rust on it. Well, let's take them. Not so fast, no one. Suppose they say they never met your friend, Breeden. Know nothing about him. We need proof. Just what do you have in mind? You know those guys pretty well. Know their business lingo, the way they operate. Can't you think of some way of going in there, doing a little fast talk? Well, if I do, it's not a bad story. No. Not bad at all. Good luck. <laughs> It is, Mr. Stiles. Who are you? Where is Bronson? Downstairs. Who are you? Well, my name is Norton. Didn't you hear about me? I was supposed to make arrangements with Mr. Breeden for the delivery of 21 cases of stock a week and a half. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Little Richie told me about you. Hey, ain't you the fella? Yeah, we met you on the road, Verdigree Valley. I was sorry about that. We had to change our headquarters. How'd you find us? <laughs> Look, I've got a lot of money invested in my business. A little tracking down if somebody never bothered me. Okay, sit down. What do you get for a case of domestic stock? Run you about $170. I'll take 12 cases a week. Give you $20 a case. All right, who are you kidding? $20? No, no, I'm quite serious. You see, I happen to know that I can get it at $20 a case. Well, go on, peddle your papers somewhere else. The price is $170. You see, I happen to know that you and Bronson and my friend Breeden were driving in from California. I happen to know that you got into a fight with him. And I happen to know that you stole $17,000 in coins from him. And there are stains in the car right out in the back and a wrench with stains on it, and I don't think they're rust stains. Hey, now, uh, now, take it easy, will you? Now, look, uh, we can do business. Say, I've got another idea. Why does it have to be Norton and Stiles and Bronson? Why can't it just be Norton and Stiles? What do you mean? Just you and me. 
Come on now, who did it? The breeding, I mean. Was it you? Or maybe a friend downstairs? You know, if we come to a deal, cutting something three ways is less than cutting something in two. Yeah, that's just how it happened. He did it, Bronson. I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to make a deal. But that Bronson, he's got a temper like a wild man. You mean it, you and me? Why not? The cops are looking for a fall guy. You testify, I testify, and it's Norton and Stiles. I should have met you before. Norton and Stiles, what? eh? Now, ain't that pretty? And the cops need a fall guy, Now, eh? wait a second, Bronson. I was just... Yeah, talking... maybe instead of a fall guy, the cops will get a corpse. Maybe two corpses. Mr. Bronson? Yeah, or... that's right. Mr. Bronson. Who do you think you are coming in here making deals? Just a guy, anxious like you are to make a buck? Now, look, you shut up. Two red cents, I'd knock you right through the floor where you're standing. Norton and Stiles. Now, look, Mr. Bronson, you can't do business that way. It can't be done. Corpses, two corpses, knocking people through the floor. All I want is the best possible deal I can get. Where did you dig this thing up from? You think you can talk your way out of this? I heard what you said. I was standing behind the door. Now, I don't know who you think you are or what makes you so cocky. What, what makes... makes me so cocky, as you put it, is what's out in the back. What's supposed to be out in the back? In the car. 17,000 in Mexican coins. Like the ones found near Breeden. Stains on the floor of the car and a wrench out there. Stains on that, too. Nobody saw no $17,000. There's no stains, no wrench. All I see is a wise guy who talks too much. For my money, I smell cop. Amateur cop. Now turn around. Hey, Bronson, I think maybe we ought to make a deal. You already done enough thinking. Maybe you ought to turn around, too. I said, turn around. All right, all right. I was only... Trying... He was only looking for me. Let's stand where we are, right where we are. Hello, Nick. Oh, I knew it. Maybe we ought to make a deal. Please, yeah, Bronson. Oh, oh, Bronson. Shut up. That's right, both of you. Now, let's go. Oh, uh, Nolan. Hmm? Give you a tip. Sure, Nick. Don't try to move into bootlegging. Not in your line. Not your style. <laughs> <laughs> you stick with the papers. Thanks, Nick. Don't think I won't. Now we read you that telegram from Nolan Bullock of the Tulsa, Oklahoma Tribune. Both men in tonight's big story pleaded guilty to second-degree manslaughter. Admitted killing Breeden after he attacked them. Both were sentenced to ten years of hard labor at the state penitentiary, McAllister, Oklahoma. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Uh, uh, uh.